Welcome to another presentation. As always, an illustrated PDF of this talk is available by clicking the link on the initial YouTube screen. Now you might think the layout of this initial slide is a little odd, but hopefully it will become clear to you during the presentation. If you've been following the story so far, you'll be in no doubt as to the identity of this man, Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. We know he was a very religious man. Indeed, his annotated Bible still survives. He was deeply involved in mysticism under the influence of Dr John Dee. He believed that the universe could be defined in numbers and that each person had their own special numbers which brought them close to God. In his case, the numbers 17 and 40. In Alexander Waugh's recent brilliant YouTube video, The Divinity of Man, he describes how these two numbers relate to the very fabric of the universe. De Vere really believed that God spoke through his works. He had an interest in astrology, the influence of the heavenly bodies on our lives. He also had an interest in Greek and Roman mythology, using its stories widely in his poetry and plays, often employing allegory to give them new meaning. This was based on his obsession with the work of the Roman poet Ovid. Not surprisingly, it, as it was he who translated his works from Latin to English while he was still in his teens. Whatever the reason, he launched himself into the printed word under the pen name William Shakespeare, aged 43, in 1593. You are looking at the only known copy of the first edition of Venus and Adonis, a narrative poem of some 1,194 lines. On the left-hand page is an engraving of Henry Rosalie, 3rd Earl of Southampton, to whom it was dedicated. This was pasted in at a later date. And here is the title page. A picture, a title, some Latin, a strange design and where to buy it. Oddly, doesn't say who wrote it. This talk is not about a detailed study of the work itself. It's principally about the first two pages, looking for evidence of the true author being Edward de Vere. I will present you with a series of observations and indeed pose some questions. My aim is to stimulate thought and discussion. The story will take us into the realms of emblems, mysticism, printer's devices and some very interesting people. So let's start with a brief outline of the story of Venus and Adonis. Both the Greeks and the Romans were fascinated by this tale of love between the Greek goddess Aphrodite, her Roman name being Venus, and the mortal Adonis. We've met this man before. It's Publius Ovidius Naso, the Roman poet better known as Ovid. He published a series of poems entitled Metamorphoses in 15 volumes, all with the theme of change, and it's highly likely that Edward de Vere made the English translation, which was published in 1567. De Vere drew heavily on Ovid's account, although the ending is different. This is one of a number of paintings by Titian of the encounter between the goddess and Adonis. It's important for it shows Adonis wearing a hat, something referred to in the poem. And it was known to have been in Titian's studio in Venice in 1575, when Edward de Vere lived there. In a nutshell, Venus comes to earth looking for love and falls for Adonis. She does her best to seduce him, as you can see, but he is more interested in the hunt. Having rejected her advances, he goes off with his dogs in search of prey. Venus goes looking for him, only to find that he's been slain by a wild boar. His blood has stained the nearby flowers purple. Miraculously, the body disappears to be replaced by a purple flower checked with white. She picks it and compares its purple to blood its scent to his breath, and its sap to her tears. She says she will have it dwell in her bosom, where its father once lay, and she will rock it and kiss it day and night. Racked with sorrow, 
Venus returns to the heavens in mourning. Was the launch of Venus and Adonis a publishing success? Well, to understand this, we need to think about Tudor England, London principally. The population of London was around 150,000 in 1590. Literacy, as judged by the ability to sign their name, was around 45% for men and 3% for women. To say the least, this was setting the bar pretty low. The size of the nobility, including the court, was around 1,500, and there were about 4,000 foreigners in the city. There was a sizable number of middle-class traders and businessmen, but the vast majority of people were poor, living in squalid conditions, and they didn't spend the evening reading poetry. So the market for an 1,100-line poem by an unknown author, based on an obscure Roman poet, would not have been great hardly enough to get it into the Sunday Times bestsellers list. However, it's been referred to as a very successful poem, going through 15 reprints between 1593 and 1640. That brings us to Elizabethan printing. This was heavily controlled by restricting the number of printing presses. There were around 20, even as late as 1610. And secondly, it was controlled by censorship by the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Stationers' Company, with whom any new publication had to be registered. Anything contentious was blocked or even recalled and burned if views changed. There was no distinction between printers, publishers and booksellers. Most did everything. The business was concentrated around St Paul's Churchyard. Indeed, in 1556, of the 32 booksellers and printers working in London, 15 lived and worked in the churchyard, with another five close by and eight in Fleet Street. So this was a pretty small world. The number of reprints, of course, does not give any full story as to how popular something was. That depends on the size of the print runs. Well, it's recorded that a couple of men like this, inking the print and stamping, could print out 3,600 copies in a day. In fact, the average print run for a book was around 1,000. Now, Venus and Adonis was printed initially in quarto. This means that from one sheet of paper printed on both sides, you could achieve eight pages of printed text. Don't worry about the arrangement of the pages. All you need to know is that by making a single cut, you arrive at four folded leaves that can be stacked together. These leaves can then be inserted into a gathering, which is sewn together and bound. Now, after 1594, the book was printed in Octavio. By dividing the pages into eight, This produced 16 pages of printed text with just three cuts. But the clever thing was that Venus and Adonis' text on each page was the same size as in the quarto version, so quicker printing and half the amount of paper. Now, was this because it was so popular or just to save the printer money? Probably the latter, as the printer had changed after the first four editions. It's odd, though, if the book was so popular Why are there so few in existence? If it was something to be cherished, one would have expected many copies on the shelves of the great families. Now let's have a look at the the people involved in this whole process. This is the bottom of the front page of the 1593 edition of Venus and Adonis. It tells us that it was printed by Richard Field and was to be found at the sign of the White Greyhound in St Paul's Churchyard. It's at this point that those who believe Edward de Vere wrote the works of Shakespeare can become a little nervous, for Richard Field was born in Stratford-on-Avon, and his father was a tanner who was known to John Shakespeare, the father of William. The implication was that Richard Field was engaged to print the work of a fellow townsman. All, however, is not quite as it seems. Firstly, Richard Field did not usually print this type of work, and secondly, he relied on his partner John Harrison to sell the poem. It was his shop that was at the sign of the White Greyhound. 
Although it was Richard Field who registered his right to the title on April the 18th, 1593, in the Stationers' Register, he would transfer rights to Venus Adonis to Harrison on June the 25th, 1594. Harrison continued to hire Field to print the poem until 1596, when he transferred his rights to William Leake. It seems likely that the link with William Shakespeare is incidental. If we go further up the page, we come to this rather strange and complex emblem. Here it is in colour. This is for two reasons. Firstly, because I like colouring things in, and secondly, because it makes it easier to interpret. The twisted, almost metallic shapes are a common feature of illustrations in the 16th century and give a dramatic three-dimensional effect. This is an example of a printer's mark and belongs to a gentleman by the name of Thomas Vautrollier. Where did it come from? Well, to understand this, we need to go back a thousand years. The Albigensians, or Cathars, were a heretical Christian sect based in the south of France during the 12th and 13th centuries. Their expertise was in papermaking, and every papermaker had a custom of branding almost every sheet of their paper with certain peculiar designs. A crusade was sent to persecute them, resulting in their skills spreading all over France and eventually taken by emigrating Huguenots to foreign lands. With the invention of printing came the development of printer's marks. The close association between the two professions of papermaking and printing led to the same type of evolution of these marks. The basis of them all was allegory. This term allegory derives from the Greek allegoria, veiled language or figurative. It is a story told in words or picture in which a character, place or event is used to deliver a broader message about real world issues and occurrences. Emblems and emblematic literature greatly engaged medieval Europe and printer's marks became intellectual heirlooms, crystallising ideas of the time. A perfect example of this is the work of this man, Andreas Alciato, usually known as Alciati. He was born near Milan and settled in France in the early 16th century. He was a lawyer and legal scholar, but is best known for his emblems, allegorical illustrations published in a book called Emblemata, a collection of short Latin verses accompanied by woodcuts. This became incredibly popular and was published in many editions from 1531 onwards. It spawned a whole generation of literature, the emblem book. Here is a page from the 1534 edition of Alciato's book. The anchor is a symbol of restraint, the dolphin a symbol of speed. It is entitled The Prince Caring for the Safety of His Subjects. The text translates as follows. Whenever the brothers of Titan race churn up the sea, then the anchor aids the wretched sailors. The dolphin that cares for man wraps itself around the anchor so that it may grip more securely the bottom of the sea. How appropriate it is for kings to bear this symbol, mindful that what the anchor is to sailors, they are to their people. The emblem involved in several directions. This one embodies making haste slowly, or slow but sure. Now Thomas Vautrollier was a Huguenot of learning who came from France at the beginning of Elizabeth's reign. In 1570, he opened a printing press in Blackfriars. He had several versions of an emblem entitled The Anchor of Hope. This one was first used in 1574 and was very simple. The source from which he copied it is unknown, but probably from a book of emblems. This one is from 1584, the first to show the hand from the clouds. It culminated in this one, first used in 1585. 
Voltrollier and Field were absolutely consistent in always using a form of the same design. When he died in 1587, it passed on to his apprentice Richard Field, who went on to marry either his wife or daughter. Eventually, it was passed on to the George Miller and Richard Badger partnership. Although this emblem appears on a number of Shakespearean works, it has no special significance to them. So what does it mean? Well, as you can see, there is an anchor being held by a hand emerging from the clouds. There are intertwined olive branches and the words Ancora Spei. The two figures are of uncertain meaning, but may represent mortals trapped in the earthly world. This all refers to Hebrews 6.19. The preceding verse tells us that God has given both a promise and his oath, that those who have fled to him can have confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. Then comes Hebrews 6.19. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. From Vautrollier's point of view, he was the strong and trustworthy anchor for the works he was undertaking. Now let's go right to the top of the page. Here is the headpiece of the 1593 edition of Venus and Adonis. Once again, I've added false colour to make it easier to see. So we have a central head two peacocks, a couple of cornucopia and two legless creatures with musical instruments. Then there is an interweaving leafy design. So is this just something to brighten up the page or is it meant to convey a specific message? Well, just like printer's marks, page ornamentation found its origins in early emblems, resulting in this type of design. It is, of course, highly allegorical and as such can be used to express different meanings depending on the knowledge of those who viewed it. The central figure is the Roman goddess Juno, who was often shown with peacocks. Among many roles, she presided over every aspect of a woman's life. She was the protector of legally married women and even had her own festival, Matronalia. The cornucopia, or horn of plenty, was a symbol of abundance and nourishment. It was the attribute of several Roman and Greek deities, amplifying their attributes. And you can see here that they are emerging from the head of the goddess. These two creatures are fauns in Roman mythology or satyrs in Greek. They were forest people with horns, pointed ears and hind legs of a goat. They were the symbol of fertility and had a reputation for unrestrained revelry in any form you wish to imagine. These creatures appear commonly in Renaissance art. This fine example is a detail from Titian's work entitled Bacchus and Ariadne. The leafy design which ties the whole lot together uses the acanthus plant as its source and was commonly used in both Greek and Roman design. The leaves, for example, appear at the top of Corinthian columns. Note on the right how the design merges into a metallic structure in the shape of an A, something which I'll come back to later. What you might ask is an acanthus plant. Well, you've all seen it. Here it is, Acanthus mollis, better known in the UK as bear's breeches. It has quite extraordinary flowers hidden in spiked bracts, the wavy anthers almost snake-like. And you can see from the drawing on the right how the design emblems have been developed. What does it mean? Well, there is a story that Acantha was a nymph who spurned the attention of Apollo, and when doing so, scratched his face. In response, he turned her into a thorny plant, while beautiful from afar, unpleasant close up. Acantha was referred to in an 1839 classical dictionary by Lemprieri, but there seems some doubt about her appearance in ancient Greek sources. So there's no doubt we have a celebration of Juno, and a possible reference to Apollo. This headpiece was quite special. 
In this form, it appeared in only three publications. The second one was in the 1594 edition of Lucrece, again printed by Field for John Harrison. The third was in the title of a book by the cartographer John Speed, published 17 years later in 1611, in which he used his map drawing skills to produce the family tree of pretty well everyone in the Bible. As a historian, he didn't have much time for Shakespeare, calling him a superlative monster. As for interpretation of the headpiece, my view is that it is a celebration of the bountiful queen of the goddesses. Its single later use was the choice of the publisher, which I'll come to later. Interestingly, a modified version was used in the title page of the 1609 version of the sonnets, with added emblems of winged putty, sea monsters, fishes and rabbits. Next we come to the title of the book, Venus and Adonis. Now many of the Greek deities were incorporated into Roman mythology, usually with a different name. This can be very confusing, so when necessary I'll use both names, the Greek one first. Venus was the Roman goddess of love and sexual desire, among other things. Adonis in this story, as I've said, is a Roman mortal, not a god. Now Venus and Juno didn't get on at all, not surprising really. In this etching, Juno, the protector of committed love in her chariot, drawn by her peacocks, is in conflict with Venus in her chariot, on this occasion drawn by doves, and she represents romantic passion. A rather distraught Cupid flies from Juno, with whom he has no place in married love. In fact, the distinction between these two types of love represented by the two goddesses, appears in The Tempest, Act 4, Scene 1, in an exchange in a mask between Juno and Ceres. So why on earth do we have Juno in all her glory at the top of the page and Venus right underneath? Now let's look at the text. V and U were considered as the same letter in Tudor printing, even though pronounced differently according to position. What's odd is that the and Adonis is in a much larger typeface. Does this mean that Adonis in this instance is more important than Venus? Does it indicate that Adonis is the real centre of the poem? Well, here's the first thought. I don't know the answer to these questions, except that I do know that and Adonis can be rearranged into a partial anagram. Diana's son, with a D left over. The goddess Diana we've met many times before, particularly as her alter ego of Elizabeth I. Could this be a hidden allegory, alluding to the flower springing from Adonis' blood as being her son? Now let's play with the word Venus. If we extend the uprights of the two Vs, then they cross to form a W. So what, you might say? But this is not an ordinary W. The intersection produces three Vs, and this can be read to represent the Holy Trinity. There is also a hidden V upside down. This is an example of there being four things in three. The quaternary within the tertiary is extolled by John Dee. The fourth emblem is man and defines his closeness to the Trinity. It won't have escaped your notice that the W is followed by an S, the initials of William Shakespeare. Now let's look again at the two words and Adonis. The letter A derives from an Egyptian symbol of Apis, the sacred bull. It then became the Phoenician Aleph before rotating round to become the familiar A. So it seems reasonable to replace the A's with the bull or ox symbol. Now in a previous presentation I discussed the use of a particular type of coding called gematria. One way of using this was to assign letters a numerical value based on their position in the Latin alphabet of biblical times where there was no J. So if we insert numbers for the two words, we arrive at this sequence, 13, 4, 4, 
14, 13 and 9, excluding the final S. If we then add the values for each word, we arrive at those magic numbers of 17 and 40, so dear to Edward de Vere. Does this tell us that Adonis is de Vere? Is it just chance? Maybe. There is another aspect to this. As many of you know, there are five emblems in basic alchemy. Earth and air are similar to the letters A, and fire and water similar to the letters V. Spirit, the ethereal emblem, is often represented as a circle. So within the title we have two A's, two V's and an O. The four basic emblems can be arranged in the shape of a five-pointed star. This, together with the circle, become this. You are now looking at one version of the double seal of Solomon. The legend of the Seal of Solomon was developed primarily by medieval Arabic writers who related that the ring was engraved by God and was given to the king directly from heaven. The ring was made of brass and iron and the two parts were used to seal written commands to good and evil spirits respectively. The seal was said to give Solomon the power to command demons and to speak with animals. And due to Solomon's proverbial wisdom, his signet ring became a symbol of Renaissance magic and alchemy. The meaning of the lettering is somewhat beyond my knowledge. I would, however, draw to your attention that in the centre is the letter Tau, the 19th letter of the Greek alphabet and the astrological sign for Taurus the Bull. It is also the centre of the derivation of 40 or 4T, in Edward de Vere's philosophy and of the emblem of royal arch masonry. There is also an alpha and an omega, a symbol of the all-encompassing power of God, and two capital letter A's, which I'll come to shortly. There is another aspect of the symmetry of the title worth looking at. We've already extended the arms of the V's upwards to reveal W, now let's see what happens if we go downwards. One downstroke passes through the letters I-O and the other through the A of Apollo. I-O in Latin is an expression of joyous exclamation such as look or behold or in Italian as I. Put together then we have W-S, behold Apollo or even I Apollo. Now let's take a closer look at that Latin inscription. The first thing to notice is that it's in italics, the history of which is interesting and revolves around this man. This is Aldus Minucius. He lived from 1452 to 1515 and was a very influential printer working in Italy. And yes, you can see a familiar printer's mark. Along with his punch cutter, Francesco Griffo, Minutius designed an italic typeface. This was to recreate a style resembling the written word and also to save space as the letters could be set closer together. So we can conclude that this represents a written message to the reader from the author. What does it mean? Well, it's a quotation from our friend Ovid. It appears in his work Amores. The Amores is a first-person account of the poetic persona's love affair with an unattainable higher-class girl, Corinna. It's unclear whether or not she actually existed or whether he was simply exploring the genre of the love elegy. Interestingly, at least two of de Vere's early poems are on the same theme. A translation of the quotation from the Latin reads... Let the mob admire base things. May golden Apollo serve me full goblets from the Castilian fount. Are you any the wiser? We need to put this into context by looking at what comes before it. It comes from Elegy 15 of the first book of Amores. The poet tells the envious that the fame of poets is immortal and that theirs is not a life devoted to idleness. By me everlasting fame is sought. 
that to all time I may be celebrated throughout the whole world. Envy feeds upon the living. After death it is at rest, when his own reward protects each according to his merit. Still then, when the closing fire shall have consumed me, shall I live on, and a great portion of myself will ever be surviving. Let the mob admire base things. May golden Apollo serve me full goblets from the Castalian fount. Now any well-read Tudor person would have known about this. So by using allegory, De Vere clearly tells us the purpose of his work. Beautifully done, I think. By way of background, Apollo is the Greek god of music, poetry and dance, healing, truth and prophecy. Most importantly, he is the god of the sun and the light. He resided at Parnassus and was the prophetic god of the Delphic Oracle. He could be reached by appointment with the Pythia, or High Priestess, who would provide you with a suitably ambiguous answer to your question in response to a sacrifice and a sizeable donation. The Castalian Spring was just up the road from Delphi and was a place that pilgrims or those seeking help from the Oracle would wash themselves. The water was also used to sprinkle in the temple. The water poured from the rock and was collected in a pool before being fed through seven spouts in the shape of lions' heads. Niches were hewn within the rock for offerings. One version of the myth was that Castalia, a naiad nymph, either threw herself into or became the spring to evade the pursuit of Apollo. In Roman times, the water itself was imbued with inspirational qualities. It's not known if De Vere visited Delphi, which lies a few miles inland from the Gulf of Corinth. Venetian ships regularly passed by en route to Istanbul, and given his fixation with Apollo, it's possible that he went there during his time in Italy in 1576. Interestingly, in Elegy 13 of Amores, Ovid describes a visit to his wife's birthplace in Felici to attend the festival of Juno, an event heralded by pipe playing through an area of great fruitfulness. This may be the origin of the headpiece design of page one of Venus and Adonis. Now Juno had many epithets usually associated with fusion of an array of minor deities under her umbrella. One such was Juno Quiritis. Quiritis was a pre-Roman Sabine goddess worshipped by the Felicians, the word for which her name derives from the Sabine word for lance or spear. Indeed, Juno is often portrayed carrying one. Could this be a reference to Shakespeare? Of which, more later. So here again is William Shakespeare's triumphant entrance into the literary scene. Have we learned anything, or are my observations just shadows of my imagination? The fact that Hera Juno is at the top of the page might suggest that the author is a supporter of the constancy of marriage. The quotation from De Vere's favourite poet, Ovid, about the importance of poets, allude to De Vere's aim to emulate him and become England's Ovid. The disparity in print sizes relegates the name of Venus as being someone the author disapproves of. The size of the word allows the construction of a large W within the confines of the page to reveal his initials. And Adonis, in huge letters, is loaded with hidden meanings. The hidden reference to the ox and the numbers 17 and 40 so important to De Vere, may imply that he himself was Adonis, the real subject of the allegorical poem to follow. The derivation of Diana's son from the same letters perhaps allude to Queen Elizabeth, who, as we've seen in previous presentation, used the goddess Diana as her alter ego. The direct reference to Apollo in the geometry of the page reinforces De Vere's belief in his work being the voice of the gods. The reference to the basic five emblems of alchemy reinforces his link to mysticism. The use of the anchor of hope printer's mark is probably circumstantial, but at the very least alludes to the dependability of the work 
and its relationship to God. This is the metamorphosis of Edward de Vere into William Shakespeare, with a great deal of help from Ovid, who wrote 15 books on that very topic. Now let's turn over to the dedication page. A fancy design, the dedication to Henry Rosalie, Earl of Southampton, the dedication itself in italics, mimicking the written word, then right at the bottom in small plain type, the name William Shakespeare. Not very much to go on, you might say. Well, let's take a closer look at it. This is the headpiece of the dedication page. The most obvious feature is the two letter A's which are bound together. You will note that the one on the left is light and the one on the right is dark. This is not due to shadowing. It is consistent across all versions of this headpiece. The letters are woven into the familiar pattern of acanthus leaves. At the top are two snail-like creatures, the one on the left being odd in that it appears to have legs. The nose of each snail touches the A. Snails signify slow but sure. Robert Greene in his poem, Dorylicious Ditty, sums it up. The slowest snail in time we see doth creep and climb aloft. There is the head of a goat at the two bottom corners. These are said to indicate tragedy and reflect the goat skins worn by actors in Tudor times. So what does the AA emblem mean? Well, here's the problem. In an allegory, it can mean anything you want it to be, provided that your readers know about it. So let's go back to the beginning of the 20th century to shed some light on this subject. Rather surprisingly, it involves this man. This is Francis Bacon, philosopher, Rosicrucian, cryptologist, guiding spirit of the Royal Society, and of course, contender for the authorship of the Shakespeare canon. The Francis Bacon Society, called Baconiana, which is quite difficult to pronounce, was founded in 1886 with the aim of studying the life and works of the great man. In the pages of this journal was published a search for a literary emblem, which to the initiated indicated that Bacon was the concealed author of the Shakespeare works. In 1912, William Smedley published this book on Bacon, entitled The Mystery of Francis Bacon in which he devotes a chapter to his search for the AA emblem in 15th and 16th century literature in the hope of linking Bacon to Shakespeare. He was unsuccessful, but as a result, a great deal has been written about the origins and meaning. Unfortunately, much of it to my mind is totally incomprehensible, being a complex mixture of mysticism and mythology ranging from the Egyptians to the Renaissance, with no firm basis on fact. For what it's worth, this is what I've been able to uncover. This is Francois I who introduced the Renaissance to France. He was responsible for building Fontainebleau. Built, you may remember, at the same time as Nonsuch Palace, with some of the same artists and craftsmen. You are standing in the private gallery at Fontainebleau. This is one of 12 composite artworks, blending paintings in a modern classical style called mannerism and complex three-dimensional stucco work. The subjects are history, allegory and myth, including that of Venus, the goddess Diana and the death of Arteon. In this one, the king is displayed as an elephant, a sign of wisdom and constancy. At his feet are three gods, Neptune, Jupiter and Pluto, with his three-headed dog. Above, a salamander is engulfed in flames, the king's emblem. Below the king, he's seen as the new Alexander the Great, cutting the Gordian knot, bracketed by an AA emblem, displayed, it said, for the first time. Much of the symbolism of the works in the gallery remain mysterious. Indeed, no explanation for the double A motif is offered. The suggestion, of course, is that they were only intended for the initiated. Francois I was well known for his interest in mysticism. The only thing that doesn't quite fit for me is the fact that the A's have not one, 
but six cross pieces. These are the two artists who worked on the Great Gallery around 1530. They were Francesco Primaticcio and Rosso Fiorentino. Both were also involved with Nonsuch Palace. In 1575, Edward de Vere spent a month in Paris and it would be surprising indeed if he'd not stood in front of this ferry painting. Some of the imagery in the gallery were based on the book Emblemata, written by our friend Andrea Salciato. This was very popular, running into 22 editions in seven languages. Alciato, in Italian, was an associate of Fiorentino. And as an aside, Glasgow University has a magnificent website containing facsimiles and translations of all editions of his book. It is in the 1577 edition of the book that we find the first printed version of an AA sign. Here is the emblem in question, entitled Better Days. There is a woodcut and then an explanation or motto. It was implicit that the meaning was on several levels. In this case, the text roughly translate as men are like pigs. They keep going forwards in search of better things. Now look closely at the woodcut. The scene is clearly near the ruins of the Temple of Solomon, with the two columns, Boaz and Joachim, on which it is written, plus ultra, or more beyond. Above the pig is the word ulterior, meaning further or more advanced, and the swinehurst is pointing to the pig and to the temple, urging it to proceed to greater things. On the ground in front of the temple is a pyramid displaying two A's. Peter Dawkins, in his article entitled The Sig Secret Signature, available on the internet, gives a comprehensive explanation of how the scene alludes to Royal Arch Freemasonry and the swineherd is Apollo, who is known to take the form of a herdsman, and the pig is Francis Bacon. My knowledge in this area is limited, for obvious reasons, except to say that the pig stroke boar is also a symbol of the De Veres. Once again, my thought is that although two A's are represented, they lack the free-flowing style of the headpiece, so I'm unsure that there is a connection between the two. Interesting, the two previous versions of the In Dies Meloria emblem, both involving a pig. The one on the left is on a plate, and on the right, the head is being offered to a seated official sitting between two pillars with the sun above the horizon. Dawkins' explanation is that all three emblems describe the ritual sacrifice that initiates go through to ascend to higher levels in the Masonic order. I must say it's very hard to argue against this interpretation, but equally hard to link it to our version of Venus and Adonis. All the hard work on this topic was carried out by A. Y. Ledson and published in 1910. I can't find any reference to the full name of this person, but let's say it was a lady. She went through hundreds of books in order to record those with AA headpieces and the results are very interesting. What she discovered was that there was no mechanism of duplicating the blocks and the same ones were used by printers in two places quite far apart. An expert in wood engraving concluded that all of one particular design was printed from a single block. In all, Ledsom identified 18 different versions of the AA headpiece and these fell into three categories. Type 1 had the AA emblem with two putty-like figures with a bowl of fruit or a sheaf of corn in between. It appeared in a wide range of publications over 40 years. However, its early use is instructive. It was first recorded in a book on Hebrew grammar, of all things, and published in Paris in 1576 by one Joe Vallese. Three years later, the same block was used by Vautrollier to print The English Republic. Now, Vautrollier was a bookseller as well as a printer. He maintained strong links with France from where he imported books. The circumstantial evidence is that this is how the AA design came to England. In 1589, it turned up in the art of English poesy, printed this time by Richard Field. 
Now this book was in its time the most comprehensive treatise on poetry and had no author attached to it. However, Richard Warman has argued very strongly that the author was Edward de Vere. So there's a possible link there. The Type 2 emblem was used 36 times in a very wide range of publications by different publishers for nearly 60 years. Two versions of it were used in the sonnets. Which brings us, of course, to the emblem in Venus and Adonis. This was used in only nine publications over a 30-year period, and where it turns up is very interesting. It first appears in 1591 in a translation of a poem entitled Orlando Furioso by Sir John Harrington. The printer was again Richard Field. Sir John was the godson of the Queen. Apart from inventing a flush toilet, Sir John was well known for overstecking the mark. His first attempt at the translation led to his being banished from court by the Queen for several years because of the salacious nature of the text. He also served under Henry Rosely in Ireland. It was a small world, wasn't it? Here is a page from the book in which the headpieces are used with great enthusiasm. The one of interest is appears vertically no less than 40 times within the whole work. There's also something else of interest here. If you take the left-hand block and rotate it clockwise, and then take the right-hand block and rotate it anti-clockwise, you'll see that there are mirror images of one another in the vertical plane. In the top picture, the light A is on the left, and in the bottom it's on the right. In other words, these are two separate blocks. When viewed on the complete page, they do appear completely symmetrical. I can only assume that this confirms some significance in the light and dark elements. The third appearance of the header, following on from Venus and Adonis, was in The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer, published by William Ponsonby in 1596. The printer was almost certainly Richard Field. Now, De Vere and Spencer appear to have close connections. Indeed, one of the 17 dedicatory verses of the original publication in 1590 was to him. The headpiece appears in both pages of Book 1, on the right and left-hand pages, and once again the blocks that were used were mirror images. Now here is a full list of the headpiece appearances from 1591 to 1619. I am unable to locate the last one, but all but one of the others, a book on horses by Gervais Markham, were either printed by Richard Field or published by William Ponsonby. Richard Field was still in possession of the printing block in 1616. So here's the interesting thing. Ponsonby published all but one of Spencer's output. He also published the works of Sir Philip Sidney. He issued both the 1590 and 1593 editions of Arcadia, the 1595 edition of the Defence of Poesy, and the large 1598 folio collection, including Astrophil and Stella. He also published the works of Sidney's sister, Mary, Countess of Pembroke. Now, Sir Philip and Edward de Vere famously did not get on. The headpiece was not included in any of his works. So what can we make of this? Well, the AA design emblem was employed extensively over a relatively short period of time, with the same printing blocks being employed by different printers for a variety of authors on a range of literature. It's highly unlikely, therefore, that the AA emblem per se signified one particular individual. Indeed, the diversity of both authors and topics of the works make it unlikely that they all belong to some sort of secret society. In one group, the A's appear like cartoon characters running away from another. In another, they are but acting like deck chairs. And in the last group, between them is a further vertical emblem which is quite separate from the acanthus plant design, but has leaf-shaped projections. And this is the one that we find in Venus and Adonis.
Ledsom's interpretation of the two A's is that they stand for albus, the Latin for white, and atta, the Latin for black, denoting the light and dark emblems. The implication was that the work contained both overt and concealed elements. It might similarly be suggested that the word was ars, the Latin for art, meaning skill or craft, the light and dark referring to comedy and tragedy. This may be simplistic, but would encompass the wide variety of publications in which it was used. An emblem can, of course, mean whatever you like. It depends entirely on context. For example, someone telephoning the Automobile Association would not expect to be put through to Alcoholics Anonymous. If an emblem appears in a document, alongside many other clues pointing to a particular individual or theme, then it's reasonable to interpret it in quite specific ways. So let's look at the emblem <clears throat> in relation to Edward de Vere and Apollo. This association appeared to be very strong. Indeed, he referred to himself as Apollo, and did others, for example, Ben Jonson in his eulogy to Shakespeare in the preface to the first folio. The interrelationship between Apollo and the other Greco-Roman deities may also shed light on an underlying meaning in Venus and Adonis. Here's a potted interrelationship. The Greek name is first. All of those below are the children of Zeus with various consorts. Apollo and Artemis Diana were twins. Athena Minerva and Aphrodite Venus were half-sisters. I'd like to show you this remarkable woodcut. It provides a Renaissance view of the relationship of Apollo to his fellow deities and appears in a book entitled Melopoeia by Petrus Tritonius, published in 1507, containing four voice settings of odes by the Roman poet Horace. Let's switch to a clearer image. It's interesting to us because of its structure and setup. Here we see Apollo wearing a crown of bays, playing with what appears to be a Renaissance stringed instrument and singing. He's at Delphi, below the twin peaks of Mount Parnassus. On the left peak is the goddess Athena Minerva on her temple, carrying a spear. And on the right is the goddess Artemis Diana, also carrying a spear. If we draw diagonal lines across the picture, they intersect at Apollo's throat. And here is an image from 1581 of the influence of the star signs on the human body. Now it just so happens that the astrological sign for Taurus the bull is the throat, indicating that the voice of Apollo is under its control. Taurus, of course, is equivalent to ox. Might it then just be that the two A's represent these two goddesses? Artemis, being the moon goddess, would chime with the dark emblem. If we flip back to the title page for a moment, you'll remember that I pointed out that there are two A's in the headpiece. Together with Hera, Juno, we now have three spear-carrying goddesses with Apollo below. Could this be a further emphasis on the name Shakespeare? Before we leave the double emblem, here is one more thought in relation to Apollo. Could this centralised element be a stylized eye? This involves the story of a young Spartan man called Hyacinthus. He was a young lover of Apollo, and together they went out discus throwing. After Apollo had thrown it, the discus hit a rock, bounced back and struck Hyacinthus in the head, killing him instantly. Apollo was distraught, and as the blood mingled with the soil, a plant appeared, something like a lily. Apollo cried in anguish, I, I, and inscribed the letters A-I on the petals of the plant to beautify it further. The plant is thought to have been a larkspur rather than the modern hyacinth. Here's the point. The myth was retold by Ovid in Metamorphosis, and the fate of the young man bears great similarity to that of Adonis. 
So is this another allegory telling us that de Vere was responsible for a metaphoric killing. At last we turn to the dedication itself. I'm not going to analyse the meaning of the text, but its structure and what just might be a clever switch which turns on and off a meaning. Here is the dedication page. Now several things have been pointed out before. Alexander Waugh tells us that in the name William Shakespeare there are 17 letters after the W and that in the total there are 17 W's in the whole text. I think there may be more to this and it's all about V's and W's. Essentially it was common to use double V as W in large type or at the beginning of a word. Of the 17 W's, 10 are set as VV shown in red. Six of these arise in the last three lines. Even the W's that are used are not the same. The two green ones are normal size, but the four blue ones are rather small and sit above the baseline. It's reasonable to conclude that the typesetter had run out of W's. Here is the second edition published in 1594. Although the words are the same, the whole piece has been reset with differences in spelling and line breaks. The typesetter has, however, retained eight double V's. One might expect that all of the W's would have been used up first, yet there are three in the penultimate line. Now there's an interesting consequence of this. By working backwards and forwards from the double V's, the word via and there can be picked out 11 times. Here it is with the background darkened. Yes, I can hear you say R's and E's are common letters and what about the single V's in the piece? Well, there are eight of them from which you can do the same thing. But there's something else. V is the 20th letter of the alphabet and using gematria we can produce two twenties which if you add it up of course is 40 the number again which expresses Edward de Vere's closeness to God. So either the double V's are just a chance fluke of typesetting or they are a switch which tells you to look out for de Vere and lo and behold there it is. Just as a footnote we have already derived via from Rosalie's name, we can also extract the words son of from the sentence as well. My message is merely this, don't rule it out as a possibility. Very rapidly, the things I've elaborated vanished from the scene. I can find no images of the third edition, but the fourth edition in 1596 looked like this. If there were any hidden messages in the original versions, they were lost. So to sum up the dedication page, the AA design emblem was probably imported from France around 1579 by Voutrolier. The three main designs were used heavily during the 1590s and then sparsely thereafter. The design from Venus and Adonis was used by Richard Field from 1591, initially for publications linked with Edward de Vere, then by publications by him and later at the discretion of the publisher William Ponsonby for other projects. The original meaning of the AA design emblem is open to argument but probably represents the general emblem for the art of writing. A case can be made for the linked double A's to be more specific to de Vere and his associates, initially at least a point emphasised by its absence from the published works of Sir Philip Sidney, also by the same publisher. The AAs can be seen as an allegory of de Vere as Apollo and his relationship with Athena, Juno and Artemis, the spear-carrying goddesses. It's also possible that there is a further allegory based on the myth of Hyacinthus. The manipulation of the Vs and Ws provides interesting speculation on cipher design. So that brings us to the end of what I hope has been an interesting journey for you. I'm sorry it's been a long and tortuous one but I wanted to explain the whole story. 
At the very least, I think I've found strong evidence of the philosophy of Edward de Vere concealed within just these two pages. What I haven't discussed is when the poem was written, to whom the allegory refers, and why Edward de Vere chose to take up his pen name in 1593. I'm sure that that too would make an interesting investigation. Thank you very much for watching.